Hi, everybody. My one sort of preemptive caveat is when I do public speaking, I start sometimes get Tourette'sy. Um, especially at a yoga festival, like all of a sudden it's like, ah, oh, motherfucker, this. Like something about the context of being at a yoga festival just makes me want to swear all the time. Um, so <clears throat> how many people here have any sort of passing familiarity with music therapy? One, two, okay, good. So if I'm saying stuff, it won't seem completely self-evident. Um, well, to some of us it will, some of you it will. First, I just wanted to talk about, and this is kind of like a 12-step meeting, um, my, how I first sort of became addicted to music. Um, when I was three and a half years old, and I remember this is one of my first ever memories, I was in the car with my mom, um, and Proud Mary by Credence Clearwater Revival came on the radio, and uh, it was the first time I remember hearing music, and I remember... Um, sitting in the car with my mom, and Proud Mary was on, and I refused to get out of the car while the song was playing. Like, literally, like, she was like, okay, we've got to go. And I was like, no, like, transfixed. Kind of like, I imagine, uh, I was going to think of, like, like, maybe Charlie Sheen, like, the first time he did cocaine. Like, just like, this is my life. Like, and, and so ever since then, like, nothing affected me as powerfully as music. Um, and it, like, when I, the first job I ever had was working as a caddy. And the only reason I had this job was so I could buy records. Um, and I remember I was like, in Connecticut, in the middle of the summer, like I was really little, carrying like huge golf bags, cause it was some like, it was a strange golf course in that it was very, very fancy, which meant they didn't have golf carts. Does that seem weird? Like, if you're like rich people, why wouldn't you want like? But they're like like this old timey golf course, and they would hire little scrawny people like me to carry their golf bags. Maybe it was a form of like I don't know. They could like it was like weird sadism. Like you could be like the big fat corporate titan of industry, looking at like the scrawny little thirteen year old like weighed down by the bag of golf clubs. But I only worked there so I could buy records. And when I was growing up, I didn't spend money on anything except for records, because I was completely, completely obsessed with music. And I started playing music when I was around 10 years old. Um, I learned how to play guitar, and then bass, and then keyboards. And I knew that I wanted to spend my entire life making music, because it was the only thing that I truly loved. Um, I never thought I'd have a career as a musician. I thought that I would probably, you know, like, work at Arby's by day and make music at night. I also imagined that I would just be in, like, a loveless relationship and like live in the suburbs and just be sad. Um, maybe like I would start smoking at some point just to like sort of like hasten my demise. Um, but I just knew that I want all I want to do is spend my life working on music. Um, and but deep down, I sort of saw music as this like just fun, lighthearted, frivolous thing. Like I loved it. Everyone I knew loved it. I'd go to concerts and I'd see thousands of people like with their hands in the air cheering. And so I knew it had some power, but it didn't seem like a legitimate power. It seemed like, you know, fun, lighthearted, insubstantial, like no one took it seriously apart from people who were making music or making money from making music. But like science never really looked at music, um, neuroscience didn't really look at music. And then, uh, I guess about 12 years ago, um, a friend of mine, did anyone here know Eddie Stern? You know Eddie Stern? Um, he has a yoga school in New York called the Patanjali Yoga Shala. And I always have to out Eddie. He started working at Jiva Mukti in the 80s. And when I first met Eddie, he had a big red mohawk. And um, so... Eddie's dad uh, became the chairman of this organization called the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function. And the, this institute was started by Oliver Sacks and another doctor, Dr. Connie Tomeno, I think in the 80s. Um, so who here, does anyone know Oliver Sacks? Um, if you ever saw the movie Awakenings, Awakenings is based on Dr. Sacks. 
I guess his most famous book was The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Um, and he's just a really odd, amazing, genius, idiosyncratic neuroscientist. I also have to say, if I'm rambling, I had a giant cup of coffee a little while ago. So I do sort of feel like Charlie Sheen in Reno. Um, so I started to get involved with this Institute for Music and Neurologic Function. Because up until this point, like, I had dedicated my life to music, but I thought music was frivolous. I thought music was fun, and it was what I loved, but no one took it seriously. Um, and then I started working with Dr. Tomeno and Dr. Sachs, and what they, for decades, have been doing research on is how music actually is a remarkable healing modality. Um, and there was traditional music therapy is, for example, if someone is about to get surgery and you play nice music before they get surgery and after they get surgery, it can diminish their healing time. So a lot of hospitals really like music therapy because it gets patients out the doors faster. Um, and, and then there's another type of music therapy where if like you're in long-term care, people will go around the hospital and play songs for you, which makes your hospital stay nicer and can also facilitate healing. But what Dr. Sachs and Dr. Tomeno focused on was music's ability to affect the brain. And, and the research they've done is, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of tricky. It's sort of hard to talk about it because if I describe it, it sort of, it sounds miraculous. Um, it started, I guess, in the 70s or the 80s. Neuroscientists, up until a certain point, believed that your brain had a finite number of neurons. And that after a certain age, let's say after 10, you would just be sloughing off brain cells. And the best you could do is like try and like protect the few brain cells you had and not, you know, like maybe wear a helmet if you're playing football and try not to like sniff model airplane glue. But like it was just this constant decline, you know, like you're, you're always going to be losing brain cells. And then at some point, I think in the 80s, people realized that the brain was capable of creating billions and billions of new brain cells up until the day you die. Um, it's a process called neurogenesis. I'm sure most people here are familiar with that. It's the brain's ability to regenerate itself. Um, in certain regions of the brain, neurogenesis might not be happening, but other areas of the brain, neurogenesis is ongoing right now and you know, until you take your last breath. And what they'd found is there's certain behaviors that inhibit neurogenesis and promote neurogenesis. Um, some of the things that inhibit neurogenesis are stress, anxiety, a sedentary lifestyle, um, eating animal products. Hello. Um, seat at table dinner, that's vegan. Um, and smoking, drug abuse, alcohol consumption. These are all things that, that inhibit neurogenesis. Um, things that promote neurogenesis, veganism, uh, exercise, being happy with what you do, a diet rich in antioxidants, in other words, a vegan diet, um, a diet not high in saturated fats, oh, and like a vegan diet, and just basically taking care of yourself and being very active. And Dr. Sachs and Dr. Tomeno realized that in all their studies, one of the things that promoted neurogenesis m almost more than anything was music. And, and then they started noticing that like when they were doing conventional music therapy with patients at Beth Abraham Hospital where they both worked in the Bronx, um, they started noticing these sort of seemingly anomalous, miraculous events where someone who had had a stroke and had lost the ability to speak could sing. Um, someone who'd had a stroke and had lost the ability to move could tap their feet when their favorite songs were being played. And so Dr. Sachs and Dr. Tomeno started doing all this research, and they found that music... Well, okay, I'm, I know I'm rambling on a little bit, but do you know the concept of phrenology? Okay, so phrenology, I guess in the 19th century, or even before the 19th century, it was this idea that the brain was very localized, like you had this part of the brain that controlled your criminal instincts, and this part of the brain that controlled your desire to be nice to your family. And for the most part, phrenology was discredited. 
but there are brain regions. There's a speech center, and there's a visual center, and there's movement centers. And if a patient has had some sort of traumatic brain injury or stroke, sometimes these areas are damaged, which is why people have strokes and they can no longer speak. But what they found is that music somehow miraculously affects the entire brain. So when someone's had a stroke and they've lost the ability to speak, they can still sing. And or if someone's had a stroke and they've lost that ability to move, they can actually get up and dance. And when you see this happening, I mean, that, that, sounds, can I just, that sounds absurd to me. Does it sound absurd? But it, somehow it's true. And I've gone to visit Beth Abraham Hospital in the Bronx, and you see this happening, where like an 85-year-old woman in a wheelchair, and she's basically non-responsive, and you play her favorite song from when she was 13 years old, and she can start singing. Um, or instances where a man is in a wheelchair, he can't walk, you play his favorite song from when he was 14, and you prop him up, and he's able to sort of shuffle around, you turn the song off, and he falls back into the wheelchair. And so, I mean, one of the reasons why this work isn't, why more people aren't familiar with it, is there's no way to make money from it. So when they go before the NIH, and lobby for music therapy, there's no financial incentive. You know, there's like, farm, you know, there aren't pharmaceutical companies benefiting from this. So it, year after year, they, they go with all their evidence, all their research before the NIH with, you know, other great neuroscientists. And eventually it's slowly being recognized that this is a really sort of effective healing modality. Um, what was I actually wrote notes. What was um, and, uh, so, what they also have found is when music, you know, when someone is aphasic, and they've lost the ability to speak, and they can sing, by, by doing music therapy, the brain through neurogenesis is actually able to almost rewire the speech center. So by getting someone to sing, you know, a stroke victim who can sing, they can actually get them to the point where they can start to verbalize again and communicate and speak. Um, and it, when you see it happening, it's, it's just miraculous. And some of the other work that they've done is uh, with Alzheimer's patients. The Institute is one of the only organizations that has discharged people with early onset Alzheimer's. Um, I mean, normally, as you know, if you are, someone's diagnosed with Alzheimer's, it's essentially a death sentence. And music therapy is one of the only things that has been able to sort of like inhibit and stave off the worst ravages of Alzheimer's. Um, so this is why, I mean, for me, when I discovered this institute, it all of a sudden, I, I suddenly, it made me see music in such a different light. Because as I said, up until this point, I had seen music as like a fun, frivolous, lighthearted thing, you know, something that you know, I listened to and it made me really happy, but I never took it as seriously as, you know, other more sort of like seemingly legitimate, uh, you know, spiritual approaches or approaches to healing, um, which then sort of made me think, like, what other, and this is only tangentially related to music, like, what other things in my life am I giving short shrift to because they don't seem as sanctioned. Um, and I started thinking about spirituality. And I had this sort of vision of like someone pursuing happiness, you know, so th whether it's through meditation, through a spiritual practice. And, you know, the idea would be someone going into their little meditation room to meditate and to cultivate happiness, but like shutting the door on their friends, their family, their dog, health, et cetera, beautiful weather, to try and cultivate happiness. And it suddenly made me realize there's so many things in our lives that are ubiquitous and free or incredibly inexpensive and that we're already, that have proven healing powers, but we don't, we discredit them. And we discredit them usually because no one has sanctioned them. You know, like we're, I'm just going to speak for myself, like, in my spiritual past, if I read about a spiritual tradition that was 3,500 years old, you know, invented by people 6,000 miles away, that I would take seriously. 
But if someone said, oh, playing with a dog, that's really spiritually healthy. I'd be like, no, it can't be because it's playing with a dog. Like it's right in front of me. It's ubiquitous. It's commonplace. How can this have, how can this be as legitimate as something that some dead guy talked about 3,500 years ago? And the absurdity of that, and the more I've studied, whether it's regarding music or these sort of like commonplace ubiquitous things in our lives that are incredibly healthy, um, the more I've realized like how much power the mundane has. Um, there's a great neuroscientist named Rick Hansen. He, does everyone knows Rick Hansen? Okay, he works at Spirit Rock a lot of the time. Um, and he's done a lot of research into this, like again, the healing power of things that we consider mundane. And it's really, to me, quite revolutionary that for something to have remarkable healing properties, it doesn't need to be sanctioned. It doesn't need to be 4,000 years old. You know, it doesn't need to be institutionalized. It doesn't need to be purchased. You know, there are things that are already in our lives, like music and friends and dancing and even just like optimism, you know, things that we have ready access to. And all my research indicates that whether it's listening to music that you love or dancing, like decreases all the stress hormones, decreases epinephrine, it decreases cortisol, and it's right in front of us. And it, it's been fascinating for me how suspicious I am of the power of things that I have easy access to. You know, this weird idea that the only healing can come from things that are unpleasant, difficult, old, or expensive. As opposed to, like, the most beautiful glass of fresh-squeezed orange juice, you know, drunk on a beautiful day with someone you really care about. You know, how we just, we ignore that. And this neuroscientist, Rick Hansen, um, there's an old adage in neuroscientists, which is the neurons that fire together wire together. And <clears throat> it's sort of in keeping with a lot of meditative traditions that if you apply your attention to something, your brain re sort of rewires itself. And it's allowing yourself to recognize that when you're listening to your favorite song and it's making you sweaty and you're happy, like, it's really good for you. Like, it's not just fun. It's not just, like, lighthearted. It's not like, oh, I'm going to listen to some of my favorite songs, then I'm going to go do the real work, you know? Like, I'm going to have fresh-squeezed orange juice with this person I love, but then I'm going to get on my mat and do the real work, you know? Or, like, I'm going to go for a hike on a beautiful day with people I really care about, but then the real work will happen later when I'm at the yoga studio, you know? the real healing, wonderful work, it's all around us. It's just like making an effort to notice it and cultivate it. And what's nice is now diagnostically becoming aware of the fact that it's not, it's not just anecdotal. It's not someone saying, oh, if you listen to your favorite song, it will increase healing. You know, they can actually show that it promotes neurogenesis, decreases stress hormones, strengthens your immune system, does remarkable, remarkable things. Um, so I think that's pretty much all I had to say. Hopefully I didn't seem too tedious or pedantic. Um, okay, well, thanks, everybody. Yeah.